Winemaking at Wins not only reflects the present and the um, current vintage conditions and, and what's happening in our vineyards, but also is definitely informed by the past and our history. Coonawarra really began with a Scottish pioneer by the name of John Riddock back in the late 1890s. He recognised the quality of the beautiful red soil on the Terrarossa Ridge. He uh, built the winery, the Tri Gabled Winery in 1896, the first winery in Coonawarra. The next important chapter is the Wynn family. They bought the property in 1951. They planted a large area in the Terrarossa soil, for which I'm currently grateful for today. The essence of Coonawarra for wine quality is both this magnificent Terrarossa soil, which is a red clay loam over limestone, and it has the perfect drainage and physical properties for growing of good concentrated, fine Cabernet Sauvignon and Shiraz in particular, but also the cool climate. We're influenced by the Southern Ocean and um, the cooling effect that that has. We have a joke in Coonawarra that you've got to live here for a long time to see any of the hills and the valleys here because they're not very distinct. But when you live here and you know the environment intimately, you understand that those small elevations and, and hills and undulations are really important in terms of improving and growing great quality Cabernet. The art of winemaking at Winds involves respecting all the individual vineyard parcels and acknowledging their individual personalities and character and bringing them to the best that they can be individually. When someone opens a bottle of wins, I would hope that they will always be happy that they're going to see a consistent reflection of Coonawarra that is a reflection of all of our history, of our heritage vineyards, of our care, and of this beautiful environment. Good evening and welcome. How exciting is this, sitting within arm's reach of some of this country's finest wines? I'm Stephen Claney and I'm here to help you celebrate the launch of the Wednesday 2015 collection, the new vintage releases from Wynn's Coonawarra Estate and thanks for finding the time to join us. Now, I'm sure most of you would know that Coonawarra is one of Australia's most celebrated wine regions, and Wins is regularly referred to as the benchmark in Coonawarra Cabernet Sauvignon. Well, tonight with you, we will taste through the Wednesday release wines, and that includes the iconic black label Cabernet Sauvignon 2013, and the flagship Cabernet John Riddick from the stunning 2012 vintage. Our masterclass will run around 45 minutes and uh, we welcome your questions via the chat box below and look forward to you contributing to our discussions through the evening. So let's introduce you to our esteemed panellists for tonight. On my left is Sue Hodder, one of Australia's best known winemakers. And Sue is the winemaker at Wynn's Coonawarra Estate and she's just completed her 23rd vintage. Welcome, Sue. Thank you, Stephen. Now, just quickly, what should we be excited about with the wines we're about to share uh, with the people at home? Well, two very strong vintages in 2012 and 2013, and uh, we think this really brings a very, very strong Wednesday lineup. Terrific, and next we have uh, Wynn's viticulturist, Alan Jenkins. Uh, those who understand winemaking also understand the real partnership between those who grow the grapes and those who craft the wines. And this is one of the great wine partnerships and led to Alan and Sue being joint recipients of the Gourmet Travellers Wines Winemaker of the Year a couple of years ago. Welcome, Alan. It, it really is a, a special partnership, isn't it? Well, um, it's really all about the wine and Sue and I have been working together a long time and we've had a very clear focus on growing and making the best wines we can from every vintage and we really hope that uh, people will enjoy this lineup that we have here tonight. We look forward to hearing that shared story through the evening and what a pleasure to be joined by one of the world's most respected wine critics, James Halliday. 
Now, James has built a career across 45 years of witty and informative writing about wine. He's an unmatched authority across all aspects of the industry. He's travelled the world as a wine judge. He's written around 70 books on the subject. And he joins us tonight to share his thoughts on the new vintage. So welcome, James. Thank you. Now, you've described Wins as producing the most important Cabernet in Australia with a magnificent history. Yes, there is um, no other winery in Australia. If you look at the bottle, the label, and you were to have a bottle of the 54 in front of you, you would instantly recognise the label. The marketers have been kept out of uh, <laughs> uh, too much fiddling, yeah. but it is, it is a wonderful label and it, it is the essence of a truly remarkable uh, wine and a truly remarkable history. Every vintage bar, a couple where it just simply couldn't be made, have been produced and marketed under that label. Thank you. Well, we're very excited about hearing your comments on these wines through the evening. Now, we're privileged, obviously, to have these three experts with us today to taste through the 2015 Wins Day release wines. Don't forget, you can submit your questions to the panel at any stage during the tasting, and uh, we'll drop those into the conversations when we get the opportunity. Now, the first wine we will taste tonight is the Wins Kunawara Estate Black Label Shiraz 2013. Sue, I'll get you to start us off by describing this style of wine. Well, good Kunawara Shiraz, and it needs to be the right vineyards, is a fine thing. And you can see this is a medium bodied style. So lots of red fruits and um, silky mid palate. And uh, importantly, this is a, a wine of uh, less than 13.5% alcohol. So really a good reflection of good Kunawara Shiraz vineyards. The important vineyards that underpin this wine are some of our oldest vineyards in Kunawara. We have um, the Andulia vineyard that's 120 years old and the Johnson's block, which uh, this year is 90 years old. So they're both dryland blocks and they provide a, a wonderful heritage and underpinning for this wine. Yes, you might think it's been left too long for this wine to enter the roster. When was it first made? First Sue? made in um, 2010. Mm. Yeah, uh, so recent arrival, but by golly, it's, it's been fast out of the blocks. Um, I, I really seriously like the, just the understated elegance um, of this wine and the seamless use of oak, French oak. Look, it was a big decision for us to make it because, you know, we say our Cabernet is the most important wine and then here we are with the Shiraz. So we have to be genuinely convinced of the um, reason for being of this wine. So, and we are. Mm. Yeah, I, I, think, I think it really does, uh, in terms of the way the tasting uh, flows on, it really starts to lay the path for what we're going to discover as yeah. we go taste through. And uh, Alan, how, how do you grow Shiraz for this style? Um, Shiraz is very different to Cabernet. It tends to uh, balloon out when you get rain and you get big berries and you can potentially have uh, wines that lack intensity. So with a lot of these older vineyards, we try very hard to make sure that the yields are just perfectly balanced with leaf area. And uh, that means quite a lot of manipulation of bunches as they start to ripen in January um, by thinning them carefully and taking out green ones. So it's, uh, there's quite a labour of love put in behind the scenes here. Okay. Now, now moving to our, our second wine, the, the Wins Black Label Cabernet was first produced in 1954 and it's produced from only the top Cabernet fruit and is one of Australia's most collectible wines. James, from your perspective, what is it about this wine that makes it so special? Well, I think we've already touched uh, on at least part of the reason, which is the, uh, the great fruit, the great grapes that are now being grown. There's a huge investment in the vineyards by Wins, uh, are really remarkable. Um, what that has all ended up with is a wine with amazing um, 
uh, a clarity and power of varietal expression that with layer upon layer of fruit and uh, yet modest use of oak, uh, fr all French, uh, importantly, very importantly, and uh, with the benefit of screw cap, a 30 year plus uh, life in front of it, however good it is now. Alan, you well, we, <laughs> we, Coonawarra is a Cabernet region for a good region, reason, and uh, it's a lot to do with having a long, cool ripening season, and we have this, this ability to generate those layers of flavour by having a very extended ripening period, which is incredibly important, which many regions don't have. Yeah, so um, Black Label Cabernet is of course our most important wine and um, it's the one that we're known for and judged by and, and we're really pleased with 2013, just a lot of fruit and people like to compare vintages so we would compare 13 to 10 and perhaps 12 to 9. Uh, it's an oversimplification but it's a good rule of thumb. I guess the other thing about Cabernet and Coonawarra is that it, you have to be careful to thin the green bunches off prior to harvest so that you get that really even ripeness and you don't have any green character coming through. So we're very conscious of that and we really um, try to manage the wine so that it doesn't have any green undertones and only nice ripe tannins. And at 13.5% that is a remarkable achievement. Not too many uh, players in the in the game can do what you've done with this wine at that uh, level of alcohol. Well, Sue, we've actually got our first question in from the audience, which I'd like to, to put to you. And um, Brad wants to know what types of food best match to Cabernet. And it's a good question because <laughs> yeah. I'm always wondering what to do with no, the food and the sure. wine. Uh, and actually, it's a bit of a soapbox of mine talking about food and wine pairing and I'm um, a bit uh, sick of the hackneyed red wine um, and red meat pairing, which can work beautifully, of course, but it doesn't need to be that way. And these wines have been successfully paired with Japanese food, vegetarian, fish, um, simple food, or even just sitting down having a drink with a few olives or um, no nothing too substantial. So be imaginative with your food pairings with Cabernet, please. And James, you're supportive of that, are you? Just as long as it's not Cantonese steamed fish, I am uh, supportive of it. Uh, I'm afraid that that's a marriage made in hell, not right. in heaven. <laughs> and Alan, how do, how do you go with matching with the, the oh, shrimp? I, I really am very happy to drink this with most, most meals and um, we, we enjoyed some lovely squid yesterday for lunch with some Cabernet from Wins. So, uh, I'm black happy to drink squid, at any time. Black squid ink. Oh, of course. Yeah, of course. So you to. <laughs> it's unanimous, so we can all relax about it. That's good. Well, we now, can. It doesn't need to be elaborate either. It can just be everyday foods. Now, this fabulous table we're sitting at tonight is, is made from barrels from V&A Lane. And it's available to buy from, from the Vino Furniture Company in Melbourne. Uh, and if you visit the Wins Facebook page, you can get more information on that. And, and the reason I mention that is because the, the next two wines are V&A Lane wines, the Shiraz and the Cabernet Shiraz. Uh, actually, mm. Stephen, can I just say also, I'm just delighted to see this beautiful table because last vintage, Beth and Chris came over to Coonawarra and um, to collect the barrels from the V&A Lane Shiraz and Chris is just an amazing craftsman and he deftly disassembled these barrels and packed up his little golf and um, it was uh, packed to the gills with the um, axles just about dragging on the ground, drove back to Melbourne and made this beautiful table from the V&A Lane barrels. So really delighted to see it here tonight for Wednesday. It is magnificent. Tell us a little about the history of V&A Lane. The V&A Lane is named after Victoria and Queen Victoria and Prince Albert and uh, it's got a long history and a very valid history in Coonawarra. It was first surveyed in 1851 and uh, it was then used by quite a few, about 14,000 Chinese migrants who were 
traversing South Australia en route to the gold fields at Bendigo and Ballarat in the late 1850s. Um, it was a very straight route and uh, so a lot of people walked along this road a long time ago. Um, in more recent history, it's from a viticultural point of view, it's very important to us. Um, I, could, I could never really understand why Sue and Sarah were wanting to harvest the V&A Lane wines before anywhere else because in our region normally it gets hotter as you go north and the v &A Lane is in the middle of Coonawarra. And, um, so I, I, it took a long time to gel with me that it was actually a bit higher than the surrounding landscape and a bit warmer. Um, so it tends to be very early ripening and the vineyards here are in their mid 40s. So they've really got some heritage to them now. Now, Alan, you mentioned Sarah. That's Sarah Pigeon, who's responsible for, for making these great wines. And right this minute, she's in China in Shu Zhou's celebrating Wednesday. Um, th there's a different technique involved here, isn't there, Sue? What, what goes um, in, into the wine in the glass? Yes, and yeah, big shout out to Sarah in China. Hi, with Sarah. It, yeah, yeah. <laughs> some good regional Chinese food and a, probably a few gambais. But um, um, she does do a, um, a great job with these wines and a lot more of the um, techniques like stalk inclusion and whole berries and, and indeed co-ferment co with the next wine we'll talk about. But um, yes, a lot going on. James, I'll get you to talk us through the wines, but also we have a question from, from Danny um, for you. And he asks, how do you see this modern Australian style of Shiraz in a global context? I mean, compared with European styles? Yes, um, it, it really is um, a wine that I think will be readily understood by um, European drinkers, but really anywhere. Um, it's it's certainly got uh, that real serious freshness from 12.5% alcohol, so it's right down the bottom of the food chain, and yet it's not at all um, green. We talked about that before. Um, it's just that real freshness, and it's a wine that, for me, we talked about the other wine, drink with whatever, this one absolutely, and drink it tonight, in a week's time, in a month's time, drink it anywhere with anyone. Sue, do you want to add to that? Or? Yeah, it's a great style and one that we know will age or you can drink it now. A very um, sophisticated style. Sarah's very meticulous in the way she harvests this fruit and um, she'll, she'll pick out discrete small parcels that we, we hand pick um, for the co-fermentation. Normally Cabernet ripens later than Shiraz, but in this vineyard we we make sure the Cabernet yields are very small, very low, so that the Cabernet is coming in and ripening at the same time as Shiraz, so that it really facilitates the co-fermentation. Thank you. Okay, we'll move along. Um, in keeping with the Wynn single vineyard tradition, the Child's Vineyard has been selected to be honoured with the release of the 2012 Cabernet Sauvignon. Firstly, Alan, it would be great to understand a little bit about uh, this vineyard. I believe it has sheep in it at the moment, is that right? <laughs> there, there, are, there are thousands of sheep running around <laughs> Coonawarra at the moment. Um, it is winter. It is winter. We're very happy to have them mowing the grass while we can focus on our hand pruning to get the pruning done, which is a, a large task and needs to be done very well, setting this for ourselves up for the coming season. So it's uh, great to have the sheep plus a few kangaroos in the mix. Um, the Child's Vineyard's on some beautiful terra rossa, actually on V&A Lane too, and it's a vineyard quite close to where I live. I often walk there. It's uh, one of my favourite vineyards. And Sue, just before I get James to comment on the wine, um, how is the wine selected to be named the annual single vineyard wine? What, what's the process? Yes, thinking? and this is the um, first time we've selected Child's for our single vineyard label, which is great. Um, it's one of my favourite vineyards and I think it's Alan's number one favourite vineyard. But um, we have a, a list of about um, 10 or a dozen important Australian Cabernet vineyards and uh, we select one each year that is importantly reflects the vintage well, um, tells the Coonawarra story, it's a, it's a historic vineyard for us, 
But importantly, it has its own character or terroir and doesn't taste like the Black Label or the, um, the John Riddick. It still has the wind style, but it has its own personality as well. We love Childs. I was just going to get James to, um, as soon as he's finished enjoying it, to, uh, to tell us a little about it. Mm, if the cameras weren't on me, I might have actually <laughs> swallowed that. Um, it, look, it's, um, again, it's, it's part of a, a theme, but to, as I see this, this wine, it's got bright and lively, almost juicy fruit um, profile over a bedrock of um, ripe Cabernet tannins. And Cabernet always has tannins, but the, the trick is to get them ripe. And that's been achieved here, again, at modest alcohol levels. Very good wine. Alan, that term terroir, can you, can you just take me through that? Give me its true meaning. Um, it's, I, I guess it's the, everything in, in terms of the environmental uh, combination of climate, temperature, soil, uh, the, the total environmental impact that you have in a vineyard on that, that contributes to the final development of the fruit. And in, in Childs, it's uh, this magnificent terrassa soil that uh, drains beautifully and the vine stresses at the right level very naturally. And you put that together with Coonawarra's long, cool ripening season and cool nights and it's just exceptional, really. Just has that nice core of fruit, really nice purity. Fruit. And I couldn't resist just having a yeah, bit of a, a swallow then. Mm -hmm. Good eye. Now for something uh, special, if we haven't uh, enjoyed that enough already. Uh, first made in 1955 and a legend of the Australian wine story, uh, Michael Shiraz is Wins Coonawarra Estate's best of vintage Shiraz. Firstly, Sue, what do you look for in a grape to make this extraordinary quality wine? So the um, Wins Michael Shiraz um, was first made in 1955 and named after a son of the Wynn family who died as a young man in the 1955 Wins Michael Hermitage, as it was then called, uh, was bottled in, in his memory. That's a beautiful wine that I haven't drunk on as many occasions as I'd like. James would have had more bottles than me. But uh, the label was um, revived in 1990 and uh, here we have the 2012 version. Now, what we're looking for, and it's a genuine selection rather than a single vineyard wine, is this um, red fruit balance. So we need it to have nice ripe tannin, good concentration, texture, and we're tasting all these things in the vineyard as we go. And we, we select those parcels and they ripen early. Again, good Shiraz generally ripens early. And um, we, we select those for Michael. And it's usually the same vineyards every year. And James, what does that deliver once it gets to the tasting stage? Well, um, over the years, um, Michael, has, the quality has never been in doubt, but uh, there has been some generous use of oak in, in earlier vintages. I think one of the magic uh, things about this wine is that the oak is, it's there, it's a, uh, in looking at this table, which is not a veneer, it is, it is very, very real. Uh, it's just a, a veneer, almost a thin veneer of oak around this gorgeous, gorgeous um, fruit. Um, and uh, the other thing about it is that it, um, I don't know, I'm, it, I'm singing the same song here, <laughs> but I can't help it. It, uh, it is quite magical the way it, it marries elegance um, with that uh, density. I mean, this wine it does have density as well as elegance. And I guess that's mm, part of the reason why um, is only 16% new oak, which is really quite remarkable um, when you look at the totality of flavour. And uh, yeah, it's a, it is a truly beautiful wine. Uh, I can't see the end point for this under a screw cap. If 55 Michael is still drinking well under cork, this could be a 100 year wine for all anyone could know. But of course it won't be kept for that long, I don't know. That's not by me. <laughs> yeah, or me. Your, your thoughts, Alan? I, 
I think the season played a big part with this wine too. The 2012 year had a cool flowering and grapevines flower at the end of November. And if you, uh, the number of flowers that turn into individual berries is very dependent on temperature. And we had a, a cool flowering period in the last week of November, first week of December. And so yields were down and we didn't need to thin uh, this fruit at all. And it just came through in a beautifully balanced way without a lot of intervention from us. Whereas often with this wine, we need to uh, take a lot of the crop off at ripe the start of ripening, but not this year. Mm. So Windsor's steeped in history. H how much do you look to the past and how much to the future? Oh, well, I guess um, we, we have to acknowledge and respect our heritage and that comes into play with when we're looking at the wines of the 60s and the 50s they can um, really inspire what we're doing at, at Wins now with our winemaking and uh, particularly with the making of medium bodied low alcohol low oak wines that that is genuinely inspirational but of course we then have to stay up to date with um, climate change and um, different challenges uh, vintage wise and um, be up to date with new styles, and you just be aware of them. So it's a combination, I guess, Stephen, all those things. Just a reminder to send in your questions to us and uh, we'll share them with the panel. We actually have one for, for you, Alan, um, from Jason, who's heard there's some replanting going on at Winds. What, what's new? What's happening? Oh, there's uh, a lot of replanting at Winds. We're in a, a, a very exciting phase at the moment where we've been removing some of the old vineyards that are not uh, producing good quality anymore or they're the wrong variety in beautiful terrorossa soil where we know we should be planting new Cabernet. So uh, we're doing a lot of replanting and we've selected over a long period of time from blocks like Childs and some of these other really important Winds Heritage vineyards, uh, our own selections and we're replanting those. So. Uh, Look, look to the future, there'll be some, I think, some really amazing fruit in the near future. Because you, you have some wonderful old vines, don't you? Well, uh, the story around Shiraz in Coonawarra is certainly older than Cabernet. Um, we have some 120-year-old Shiraz, 90-year-old Shiraz. Today, the oldest Cabernet in Coonawarra was uh, only just over 60. So uh, our Cabernet generally in Coonawarra is a bit younger. Just a pup. Just a pup. <laughs> okay, thank you. We've reached our final wine as, as part of this Wednesday tasting, the iconic John Riddick Cabernet 2012. And this wine was conceived as a flagship for wins. It's made in small quantities from the best available fruit, and it's only made in years when the grapes are of extraordinarily high quality. And we know from our Winsopedia page on the wins.com.au site that this is one of our collectors' most treasured and salad wines. James, I'd like to start with you for this wine. Uh, in your most recent book, the 2016 Wine Companion, you've scored this wine 97 points and we'd love your thoughts on what makes this wine so special. Well, I think it uh, tells you what's to come, telegraphs uh, its um, power and uh, depth uh, just by looking at the colour. Once you see that, you know that there's something exciting coming up. Um, it, the, here, this idea of layers of fruit um, really comes through strongly um, and the coupled with um, really, really um, uh, clever um, use of oak and again modest uh, and it, again this is not usual, it's, it's French of course um, and the tannin here is more obvious than in any of the other wines that we've been tasting so far but it's, the tannins are ripe and they are entirely appropriate. If they weren't there, you would not be getting true Cabernet, which I suppose does then lead on to the question, well, you know, when is this wine going to be at its best? Well, my answer is you really need to, if you really want to get this wine um, humming, 
a, a minimum of 10 years, that it will go on for who knows how long thereafter. I mean, seriously, another 40 on top of that, again with the screw cap. But um, if you want to open a bottle uh, tonight, it won't bite you. Um, it, uh, it'll be great to share um, with friends. And uh, uh, you can then say, well, I've tasted it. Now I'm going to put my other bottles in the, in the cellar. That's the trick, isn't it? To make yeah. sure you have more than one. So Indeed, really that's to, true. to take it yeah. forward. So the last release of this wine was in 2010. How does the 2012 compare? Yes, uh, 2010 was a um, perhaps fruitier, rounder wine. The 2012 John Riddick is uh, more linear and perhaps a bit more tightly wound, but still great length and good fruit definition. It's a selection of less than 1% of all the parcels that we, we have at Wins. So 1%? Yep, tiny selection. Mm. So there are quite a few vineyards that, are, that we manage for John Riddock and we manage them all slightly differently to give us a range of flavour profiles and to give Sue lots of choice opportunities. And 2012 was a dry year and with Cabernet you have to be very careful not to stress it too much. So uh, managing how much water was applied to these vines was um, really tricky. And uh, if you stress Cabernet too much you'll get colour and tannin but you won't have that lovely f character of Cabernet fruit coming through. So. And, and so is this what the, the, the go saying, a small batch winemaking? Uh, yes, and lots of different batches are in contention for this label and we, we don't make the selection until the final stage. In fact, we're just going through the 2014s at the moment in the winery to work out what the John Riddick will be. Which parcels? This is your small winery within the big winery. Yes, yes, yes. it is. The nursery yep. winery, yeah. not really. But no, a lot of open <laughs> fermenters, which are great. We, we love them. Mm. Mm. A lot of hands-on stuff. Yeah, no, it's, it's terrific to have that. Mm. Look, we're, we're going to collect a, a few of your questions and put them to the panel. And, and just uh, while we're pulling those together, I, I did have one here for... Um, I guess for, for you, Sue, could be James, I don't mind who answers it, but the Wins Cabernets have a, a higher acidity than, um, than they do in, in Napa Valley, for example. Now, why is that? Uh, well, it's a completely different a growing environment in Coonawarra than Napa Valley. Napa Valley is a lot warmer, um, and Coonawarra is cooler, in particular these cool nights. And, uh, and of course, the Napa Valley wines are bigger and darker so quite, quite a different expression and, of the variety. And infinitely more tannic. They yeah, are correct. seriously <laughs> tannic. Uh, um, I won't go further, right. <laughs> but I could. OK, well, I'm, I'm armed with our questions. Jack from Hong Kong. Um, what tips do you have for cellaring wines? And should longer cellaring wines need cellaring differently? Obviously, in places like Hong Kong, if you're serious about cellaring, you've just simply got to have uh, totally temperature and moisture controlled storage. Um, corks uh, are doubly liable to deterioration in adverse um, cellar conditions. Screw caps do provide some protection um, in, again, uh, adverse uh, cellaring. So the thing is to keep the temperature as even as possible. If, again, if you've got corks, uh, moisturise the air and, uh, yeah. So uh, another question regarding this, this uh, the pairing of, of food and oh, wines. Yes. Um, <coughs> Donald from Adelaide wants to know the best vegetarian pairing that you've had with the black label Cabernet Sauvignon. Yes. Can, you, no. can you pull that together? It, actually, um, there was just a, a group of us uh, from Kunawara went on holidays to Japan and we had some beautiful Japanese food with, with our wines and just amazing tofu dishes and eggplant, mushrooms, seaweed salads, just limited by your imagination only. Alan, um, we've got a question here. How many vintages have you been with wins? Um, I've done 14 there and I'm just commencing a 15th with pruning now. Well, that leaves me to wonder how Sue survived for that first six years without the <laughs> oh, partnership. It was very yeah, well. Had a good time, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, a question from Elizabeth um, from Perth. What qualities does the terra rossa soil impart into the wine? And it's probably a question for you and also for you, Sue. Mm. 
Yeah, it's, it's an interesting one uh, that the physical nature of the terra rossa uh, imparts, it drains beautifully, so it fills up with water during the winter and so the, when that happens the vine extracts the easy water from the surface first and by the time uh, Christmas comes and you have small pea-sized berries on the vine it's starting to draw the water off the limestone. It's starting to stress slightly, so it stops growing. And this means you have good light and small berries, and you end up with uh, really good colour and tannin development from uh, the physical impact via water conservation of the soil. Um, Sue should really talk about sort of mineral characters, but I'm sure there are some flavours that come through, or James perhaps, maybe you would like to comment on, on, on some of the characters you see in the wine that, well, I, that I are not from the physical <laughs> ones. Not so. answer that question, but very quickly, a lot of people think that Terra Rossa is volcanic, because most volcanic soils are red. Um, this is entirely different, it's, it's uh, iron impurities uh, in the basically uh, the soil which has a lot of limestone in it and that means the dry soils go red and the less dry uh, get winter wetting, they get wet feet. So it's a different dynamic um, but it's terribly important. Yes and I guess um, just to, in summary I suppose it's about drainage and balance of the vine that gives us this mm. opportunity to grow good concentrated fruit. Are you finding any effect from climate change and, and how do you go around managing that? Well look, we have had um, some interesting vintages over the last decade uh, to, to give an understatement. And, um, and we, are, we are more conscious of uh, warmer and drier and um, even wetter in the case of 2011 than we would have been say 20 or so years ago. But um, look, we're, we feel like Coonawarra is well placed for climate change, not to be taken for granted, but um, yes, we do take it into consideration. We are. Um, we, we, we're trying to set the vineyards up so that we can handle a lot of extreme temperatures. You know, in, on the eastern side of the vineyards, we often remove leaves so that you get early morning sun and we protect the vineyard on the west so that the fruit doesn't get too hot in the heat of the day. Mm. So, um, and we, we have very efficient ways of conserving and using our water now. So uh, we're certainly thinking about climate change. Mm. Um, the new plantings we're putting in, we're using a range of rootstocks and, and we're learning a lot of new techniques to uh, help equip us for the yeah. future. Uh, one here, what's, what's the difference between French and American oak? Now, I'm not sure if this is in relation to the, 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 the making of the wine, the crafting of the wine, or the, the taste. So any of you can pick up on that one. Well, um, look, in very plain terms, in terms of the taste, and it's not always cut and dried either, and I've got nothing against um, American oak. It's, um, it's just that our wines are more suited to, to French. Um, in my, in the way it relates to our wines, the French oak is um, tighter and perhaps more savoury. The American oak can be more uh, sweeter and rounder. If we're going to talk about good wines, can each of you give me an example of a great old wine that you've tasted from the wind cellar recently? Oh dear, okay. So I have had 1994 John Riddick and that was a really nice wine that was a a baby for a long time, if that makes sense, and 2009 John Riddick, a middle-aged wine, drinking well. James? I don't have direct access to the Wynn's uh, cellar. <laughs> it's um, um, probably <laughs> a good thing. <laughs> but uh, uh, there is one incomparable wine, uh, 1955 Michael Hermitage. Um, it's a freak wine and uh, very unusually, uh, I've very rarely tasted um, a poor bottle, uh, even you know, when it's been 60 years, well, yeah, 60 years old. Um, it's, Rarified it's just drinking around at James's. Well, mm. they're, they're few and far between now. I, I used to drink them, yeah. <laughs> the opportunities yeah. more. <laughs> I was, uh, you can't have them and drink them. I mean, you, you do one or the other. Mm. And Alan? Yeah. 
Uh, for me, uh, recently I had a 2007, which is not that old, for Wynn's uh, Glengyle Single Vineyard Cabernet. And uh, it, I was really pleased to see that it was holding up very nicely. 2007 was a very difficult year. We had lots of frosts and we didn't make John Riddock that year. But uh, the Glengyle actually mm. is a, a very nice wine, so I enjoyed it. Thank you. Well, that, that completes our virtual tasting of the 2015 Wednesday new release lineup. A big thank you to our panellists, to, to Sue, to Alan, to James. Um, we all benefited greatly from listening to your wisdom and, of course, to you for joining us as well. The wines that we've tasted tonight are available now from fine wine retailers and, of course, from the Wins Cellar Door. So check back in at wins.com.au and the Wins Facebook page tomorrow to see highlights from tonight's tasting and more information on all the new release wines. Thanks again and good night.